There was a study in, I think, 95 in Danon Labs in Chicago where they did um, biopsy of prostate compared to serum levels of PSA in about 233,780 people, approximately, where they looked at the um, presence of cancer in the uh, prostate relative to PSA levels. What they actually found between the 2.5 and the 4.0 was another 30.1% of cancers in situ. So in my office, whenever we get a PSA level that's greater than um, 2.5, we run a free PSA and correlate the two. Also, uh, the book by Dr. Um, Abraham Morgenthaler called Testosterone for Life that came out last year. I brought him to uh, Vegas in December to lecture on this very important area of testosterone and cancer, uh, prostate cancer. Uh, there are a number of studies where they looked at uh, PIN, uh, prostatic interepithelial neoplasms, and uh, put people onto testosterone and monitored them for a year's time, monitoring the PSA level, the size of the prostate by digital DRE, and um, when they had people who, whose PSAs went up, they went back and re-biopsied them, and they found no change in the cancer. In fact, there are a number of articles coming out recently that are talking about treatment of males with uh, low-grade prostate cancer. In the LA Times health, health section, three Mondays ago, there was a section, and Abraham was uh, the key um, reference in here. He was talking about it. And the patient that they were using, the index patient they were speaking with relative to his prostate cancer, he said that if he had an option between, oh, he took the option between um, risk factor for increasing his prostate cancer and the benefits of testosterone, he took the benefits of testosterone. So there's a lot of uh, new articles in this book. It's like 16 bucks for Abraham's book, and it's a quick read. Take you a day to read it. It's got a, a lot of great things in it. Hopefully, we'll have him back sometime this year to repeat it. Anyway, um, this uh, is about cholesterol treatment as well as hormone treatment at the same time. Uh, and the reason why I don't treat cholesterol legally, I do with Zetia. But the first thing I do is correct their testosterone deficiency. And this is just some of the stats. Um, it was anticipated that with all the statin drugs that we should see a reduction in the occurrence of cardiovascular disease. It <clears throat> doesn't happen. It continues. And in studies, if you look crit critically at it, don't read the abstracts or listen to the pharmaceutical reps, you look at the actual statistics, yeah, the statin drugs drop the level of cholesterol or cholesterol by 25 to 35 percent. But if you look beyond the study of dropping it, what's really the benefit in saving people? It's very, very little. Well, cholesterol, the father of all hormones, we've always heard of pregnenolone is called the mother of all hormones. Well, if you have a mother, you need a father because you got all the kids, which are all the hormones running around in our bodies. And our present belief system is that cholesterol is the culprit of everything. It causes atherosclerosis, heart disease. Everything that we relate to as being heart disease is predicated by the bad guy cholesterol. What is LDL cholesterol really for in our body? Does anybody know what its real function is? You know, I've asked this question once before. Yeah, to create atherosclerosis. Well, LDL cholesterol is the carrier component that leaves the liver to go to the cells to provide cholesterol for repairing the wall, the cell membrane. It also is the vehicle by which cholesterol is brought to the cells to go through the hormonal cascade. HDL. Why is it so good? It is the cholesterol complex that takes the excess cholesterol from the periphery back to the liver to go into our bile salts and be pooped out. Interesting is that there's this incredible organization 
of pharmaceutical companies representing Crestor, Mevacor, Zetia, Vitorin, Lescor, Lipitor, Provacol, every call that you have except the right call for correct medicine. And every couple of years you go from 249 to 229 to now it's less than 200, the requisition for healthy levels of cholesterol. And as you drop it, you run into the problems of cyclooxygenase A2 and so forth being diminished and you run into increased heart attacks, strokes and what have you. It's all about money. The eight billion to ten billion dollars a year worldwide in the use of these medications. I use them. I use one of them because the literature is very clear. If you go to crphealth.com, Dr. Paul Reichel, Riker, you'll see his research clearly shows the benefit of statin drugs in lowering C-reactive protein. For whatever reason that there is diminished um, aperture, or not aperture, the word I'm looking for is um, diameter of the arteries. If they're diminished because of intimal thickening, which is not cholesterol-based, but is all due to these leukotrienes, uh, cytokines, intraleukins, and so forth. If you narrow the lumen, and then you have on top of it a spike in C-reactive protein, which shuts off eosinophilic nitric oxide synthetase, lowering your nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is responsible for vasodilatation, and that's how viagra, levitra, and sialis, and all those things work, nitroprusside, and so on. You get the opposite. The blood vessel constricts, and if it's an area that is already diminished lumen, You've got constriction of diminished lumen, and that's where your heart attack occurs. So C-reactive protein needs to be lowered. So it's not only with a statin drug, and the one with an L is the best one in research, but growth hormone, testosterone, DHEA, all help to stop the interleukin-6 and the uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which go to the liver to turn on the C-reactive protein. And it's a circus of vascular damage that is predicated by or precipitated by all these other chemicals. So the traditional process is perceived atherogenic factors, LDLC, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, and the events, endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, foam cell proliferation. And do you know that uh, study, I might have it here, that showed that people who are growth hormone deficient develop foam cells? And if your growth hormone adequate, you don't. So you get endothelial damage. Well, the cause of endothelial damage, I've got most of them listed here. I think there's one missing. Yes, there is. Endothelial dysfunction is damage to the lining of the artery. Well, uric acid is on the list. Homocysteine we already knew about. Hyperglycemia because of the um, glycation products, either the end or the... The other one is, um, uh, what's the other one? End, and there's one other. Um, high, um, smoking is truly it, and the use of uh, progestins, the progesterone that you get. In the studies, if, ever, if you've seen it, the study correlating um, in females, HRT, an increased occurrence of Alzheimer's or progression of Alzheimer's, it's not because of HRT, it's because of what was selected within the group of HRT. It's the progestin. 17 medroxy progesterone is not progesterone. It's a progestin that causes inflammation. You see the curve, and I might have it in here, the curve of women having heart attacks. It goes straight up, and it's at the age group that things like Provera are used. And it's the damage that occurs. Early lesions, inflammation, uh, vascular smooth muscle uh, cell proliferation, the lymphokines, the leukotrienes, and so forth, they cause intimal thickening. Do you see the word cholesterol here? Cholesterol causing intimal thickening. Cholesterol causing vascular smooth muscle. Do you see that? I don't see it. Migration factor precipitated by cholesterol. It's not there. It's like Patty Hearst. How many people remember Patty Hearst? Oh, you're as old as I am. Um, Patty Hearst was an innocent bystander who the Sandinistas Liberation Front decided to kidnap her and give her a machine gun and the only one without a mask so people could recognize her. The machine gun obviously didn't have bullets. And it was guilt through association. 